So in addition to uh, spatial models that we just discussed, uh, age-based modeling has also found a lot of application recently uh, to the study of social networks. So this was a paper I wrote with uh, Forrest Stonedahl, who's at Augustana College, and Uri Walensky, uh, who, as you know, is the architect of the NetLogo language and is at Northwestern University. And in this paper, we were interested in understanding what is uh, the best way to spread a social contagion through a network. Uh, and there's been a bunch of other papers on this, uh, but we wanted to look specifically at the question uh, as to whether or not local network properties were important. Uh, and so what you see here is actually a realization of an actual Twitter network uh, that we had collected from, uh, from Twitter via the public API of a thousand nodes. And what we found in that network was that by doing a bunch of simulations using age-based modeling was that contagion spread, spread quickest through that network when the people who were targeted with a message that you were trying to spread through the network had a, a lot of friends, but their friends didn't know each other. And so they were kind of these boundary-spanning individuals who could spread the message through the entire network. Forrest also built a nice little 3D visualization of this that I'll play now. So what you're seeing is the spread of this purple hat idea, we called it, throughout the entire Twitter network uh, that we had collected, which was a thousand nodes. And as you can see, even in the small sample of Twitter, there are definite clusters of individuals. And the, the idea spreads quickest if it's able to find the centers of all those clusters and then spread out throughout all of them. Uh, and it doesn't work if it's constrained to, to only one cluster. So in another paper I was involved with using age-based modeling, we used ABM to try and infer a social network uh, that we didn't know the properties of. So here's the basic idea. We took some Facebook data about app adoption. So we know how quickly on each day uh, apps get installed, right? And then we tried to simulate what a bunch of different uh, Facebook networks would look like that and given and that would have those kind of app adoptions, right? In other words, we were trying to figure out if we manipulate the topology of the underlying network, how does that affect the uh, adoption pattern uh, that we see? And then we tried to see using a, a Bayesian uh, method, which network was most likely to have generated uh, the adoption patterns that we saw on the Facebook apps, right? Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, we came up with a preferential attachment-like model, uh, which we'll talk about later, is the most likely topological structure of the network, uh, with a fairly low density. And you might think, well, why would it have a low density? Everyone knows everyone on Facebook. Uh, but in fact, that uh, is... is True, <laughs> you know, to some extent, but the people that you trust to uh, to recommend apps to you is probably a much smaller number, and so that network probably has a much lower density than the overall Facebook network. So this is a piece of work that I've been working on very recently with Manuel Chica, who uh, is a researcher in Spain. Uh, and we've been working on trying to understand how to use agent-based modeling to help managers actually make decisions about word-of-mouth programs that they're building. Uh, and we call this a, you know, a decision support system, which is a term that's often used in the literature when you're directly helping to try and make a decision. Uh, so what we did was we used some of the previous research we had done on agent-based modeling and viral marketing and word-of-mouth programs. And we got some data from a massively multiplayer online game. And we looked to see how adoption of premium content by one user seemed to spread through the network. We then built a model that simulated that spread and we allowed uh, inputs to the model such that managers could ask questions like, if I wanted to provide incentives to talk about premium membership or to encourage other people to become premium members, who should I target in my overall network to do that? And this uh, slide is showing you some of the results of the, those targeting policy decisions, um, but uh, it's also showing you the network of users that we were actually working with. 
Um, and here's that network again, but now with running some of the, in this case, it's actually the real data, not the network, not the agent-based model, but showing the possible connections of influence that happen within this network. Um, and we feel this is a powerful new use of agent-based modeling where you're actually using the tool uh, to help people make real decisions about what policies to implement uh, and how to understand those policies. Now, I've spent some time over the last couple of uh, talks discussing applications uh, of agent-based modeling in very complex settings to both spatial models and to network-based models. Now, these aren't the only places uh, where agent-based modeling has some more uh, complex and interesting insights to provide you with, uh, but there are two areas that I know about quite well and that I've spent some time in, and so that's why I shared these two areas with you. I highly recommend that you look at um, a, a lot of the research that's being done, and I'll try and use the Twitter feed also to post some of those papers out there. Uh, and that will give you some more insight into complex applications of agent-based modeling. Uh, you can also check out some of the websites out there where people post their models, like openabm.org uh, and uh, the NetLogo Modeling's Commons, and that will provide you with additional insight into how complex these models can get. So thanks. <laughs>